Welcome to the Royal Road School of Carmelite Prayer. St. Teresa of Avila tells us that the path of Carmelite prayer is the royal road to heaven and that those who travel it will be given a great treasure. A link to the Praying with Teresa of Avila website has been provided below to enable you to easily find the catalog of offerings on this channel along with the notes, PowerPoint, and audio for today's presentation, The Beginnings of Contemplative Prayer. The website provides all the simple tools you need to develop your own practice of Carmelite or silent prayer, along with complete course materials to start your own school of prayer in your parish or community. The Beginnings of Contemplative Prayer, Chapter 1, I Am a Daughter of the Church, by Blessed Father Mario Gen, Carmelite Friar. This prayer is a little spark of true love for the Lord, which he begins to enkindle in the soul. At the beginning of the fourth mansion, St. Teresa writes, before I begin to speak of the fourth mansions, it is most necessary that I do what I have already done, namely, commend myself to the Holy Spirit, and I beg him from here on to speak for me. God's intervention in the spiritual life, especially in the life of prayer, is a delicate and complex problem. To be able to solve the problems raised by the intervention of God, Teresa would like to have much learning. It would be useful to have some learning to explain what is meant by general or particular help. How are we to distinguish special help, which raises prayer to a supernatural level, from general help, which assists human activity in ordinary prayer. Here is the criterion St. Teresa stresses. Speaking of the first kind of prayer she experienced that seemed to her supernatural, she writes, one which despite all our efforts cannot be acquired by industry or diligence, though we can certainly prepare for it, and it must be a great help if we do. And again, we can acquire but little if the Lord is not pleased to bestow it. What are the first forms of God's act, supernatural action in the soul? The response is twofold. The logical order involving the normal development of the life of grace in the soul and the chronological order, which is the order God follows. We will focus on the logical order, but the chronological order merits our attention. St. Teresa notes in this regard, God is sometimes pleased to show great favor to persons who are in an evil state, though not in mortal sin, and yet the Lord will allow them to see a vision, to draw them back to himself. The graces enumerated by the saint, visions, interior words, raptures, are not properly speaking contemplative graces, but they are precious graces. Usually, they bring about a conversion. They reveal the supernatural world as a living reality. They dilate the soul, create in it great desires that nothing can now satisfy short of the divine life, glimpsed for an instant. Such graces ordinarily bear lights for the future. It would be imprudent for the soul to interpret them on its own. The experienced eye will see in them the form of perfection and the way God desires for the soul he has captivated. Thus they are not of great benefit to the one entering upon the way of prayer. One needs to cultivate the memory of them 
and thank God for his graces. These first favors are painful and sweet wounds. According to St. Teresa, profound mystical grace is exceptional. Ordinarily, divine mercy submits to the laws of a progressive conquest of the soul, follows the logical order. St. Teresa notes in a relation to Father Alvarez that it was that way with her. The first kind of prayer I experience, which seems supernatural, is an interior recollection of the soul. This passive recollection is the first stage of the divine invading and precedes the prayer of quiet. In the interior castle, she writes, the effects of this kind of prayer are numerous. First of all, I will say something about another kind of prayer, which almost invariably begins before this one. The first beginnings of contemplative prayer, according to St. Teresa, are passive recollection and the prayer of quiet or divine consolations. Belonging to the same period of spiritual life, we must place the prayer of contemplative aridity or of faith of which John of the Cross speaks at length in the ascent of Mount Carmel. Supernatural Recollection It is not until the interior castle and the relation to Father Alvarez written at about the same time that St. Teresa distinguishes it clearly from the prayer of quiet. She writes, It does not involve remaining in the dark or closing the eyes, nor does it depend on anything exterior. A person involuntarily closes his eyes and desires solitude. The senses and all exterior things seem to gradually lose their hold on him, while the soul, on the other hand, regains its control. It is sometimes said that the soul enters within itself and sometimes that it rises above itself. Let's suppose that these senses and faculties, the inhabitants of this castle, which is the figure that I have taken to explain my meaning, have gone out of the castle and for days and years have been consorting with strangers to whom all the good things in the castle are abhorrent. Then, realizing how much they have lost, they come back to it, though they do not actually enter it, because the habits they have formed are hard to conquer. But they are no longer traitors, and they now walk about in the vicinity of the castle. The great king, who dwells in the mansion within the castle, perceives their good will, and in his great mercy, desires to bring them back to him. So like a good shepherd, with the call so gentle that they can hardly recognize it, he teaches them to know his voice and to not go away and get lost, but to return to their mansion. And so powerful is his shepherd's call that they give up things outside the castle which had led them astray and once again enter it. I don't think I have ever explained this before as clearly as here. The saint wants to stress that supernatural recollection is something quite distinct from active recollection described in the way of perfection. Active recollection is an excellent method which disciplines the faculties, facilitates prayer, and prepares one for perfect contemplation. It is in our power, and anyone who wants to arrive at it must not grow discouraged. Passive recollection, on the other hand, is a pure gift from God, not attainable through our own efforts. St. Teresa writes, It's a great favor if God grants us this favor, recollection. Do not suppose that the understanding can reach him by trying to think of him as within the soul or in the imagine or the imagination by picturing him there 
This is a good habit, an excellent kind of meditation, for it is founded upon truth, namely that God is within us. But this isn't the prayer I have in mind, for anyone with the help of the Lord can practice it for himself. What I am describing is quite different. These people are sometimes in the castle before they have even begun to think of God at all. I cannot say where they entered it or how they heard their shepherd's call. It was certainly not with their ears, for outwardly such a call is not audible. They become aware that they are gradually retiring within themselves. Anyone who experiences this will discover what I mean. I cannot explain it better. This supernatural recollection is certainly a sign of his presence. The master does not yet manifest himself. The soul feels calmed, enveloped by some unknown power in a mantle of recollection. Its powers have become docile. Each one has be become have resumed the place assigned to it by the divine order in the soul and is filled with delight. There are degrees in supernatural recollection. At times it seemed to be produced by a call so delicate that it is almost imperceptible. At other times it declares itself a strong by a strong rapture leaving the soul's faculties powerless. It may be that this passive recollection won't be followed by any other manifestation, that it was given to calm exterior agitation or to make active prayer more peaceful. More often, it is a prelude to greater favors. Supernatural recollection heralds and prepares the way for divine visits. St. Teresa writes, his call to those who receives this prayer is a special one and aims at making them intent upon interior things. And again, a person closes his eyes and desires solitude. And without the display of human skill, there seems gradually to be built for him a temple in which he can practice the prayer already described. The supernatural peace and recollection that God has sent as a messenger before him remains in the soul after each one of his passings as the most authentic and most characteristic sign of his action. Our God is a God of peace. The Prayer of Quiet or Divine Taste Having announced himself by the prayer of passive recollection, God begins to give us his kingdom in the prayer of quiet. St. Teresa has left us in her writings many descriptions of this prayer. One of the earliest descriptions Teresa gives us is in the way of perfection. Now, daughters, I still want to describe this prayer of quiet to you. It is in this kind of prayer that the Lord begins to show us that he is hearing our petition. He begins to give us his kingdom on earth so that we may truly praise him. This is a supernatural state. We cannot reach it by ourselves. The soul enters into peace. The Lord gives it peace through his presence as he did to that just man, Simeon. All the faculties are stilled. The soul realizes it rises. It is now very close to its God and that if it were a little bit closer, it would become one with him through union. This is not because it sees him either with its bodily or spiritual eyes. Yet it sees that it is in the kingdom or at least is near to the king who will give it the kingdom. And it feels such a reverence that it dares to ask nothing. The body experiences the greatest delight, and the soul is conscious of a deep satisfaction. 
so glad is it merely to find itself near the fountain that even before it has begun to drink it has had its fill there is nothing left for it to desire the faculties are stilled and have no wish to move for any movement they make appears to hinder the soul from loving God they are not completely lost however since two of them being free they can realize in whose presence they are. It is the will that is in captivity now. In the book of her life, Teresa writes on the same subject. The powers are not lost, nor do they sleep. They will, the will alone is occupied in such a way that without knowing how it becomes captive, it allows itself to be imprisoned by God. In these two descriptions, it is clearly shown that the prayer of quiet, God's action, is upon the will, but then a confusion is possible between passive recollection and the prayer of quiet. They do not seem to be distinct. In the interior castle, with riper experience, St. Teresa gives a simpler description which explains the nature of the prayer of quiet, its origins and its effects. St. Teresa compares two basins. basins. One receives water brought from a distance by an aqueduct, but she continues. To the other fountain, the water comes directly from its source, which is God. Its coming is accompanied by the greatest peace and quietness and sweetness within ourselves. I do not think that this happiness has its source in the heart at all. It arises in a much more interior part. I think this must be the center of the soul. Apparently this heavenly water begins to flow from this source of which I am speaking, that is from our very depths, It spreads ineffable blessings. The fragrance it experiences, we might say, is as if in those interior depths there were a brazier on which were cast sweet perfumes. The light cannot be seen, nor the place where it dwells. The fragrant smoke and the heat penetrate the entire soul, and very often the effects tend to the body. Observe and understand me here. There is no heat felt, nor is any fragrance perceived. It is a more delicate thing than that. While the will is held sweetly captive by the divine lights, it is savoring. What is the state of the other powers? St. Teresa shows us that this can vary according to circumstances. At times... They share the the sweet banquet of the will. They try to deepen the quietude of the will by their own efforts, but they only succeed in agitating it. They are throwing logs on a spark at the risk of putting it out. The other two faculties, the intellect and the memory, help the will so that it may become more and more capable of enjoying so great a blessing, though Even when the will is in union, they hinder it. They are then like doves, not pleased with the food given them, and go in search of food elsewhere, but are so unsuccessful they return. Just so these faculties come and go to see if the will will give them a part of what they are enjoying. By their restlessness, these powers have made themselves incapable of tasting the divine delights. At other times, the intellect has no part in the banquet of the soul and is disturbed. It may happen that the soul is enjoying the highest degree of quiet, and it has soared so far aloft that what is happening 
seems not to be going on in its own house at all. It really seems to be a guest in somebody else's house looking for other lodgings since its own lodgings no longer satisfies it. And it cannot remain there for long together. Thus the fourth mansions characterized by quietude are paradoxically mansions of much restlessness. Again, it may happen that all these faculties are plunged in these waves of living water and are inebriated by them. The soul is so filled with the water of grace, writes St. Teresa, that it is unable to go forward, yet neither can it turn back. It is like a person holding the candle who is soon to die a death he longs for, and in that agony it is rejoicing with great joy. The faculties retain only the power of occupying themselves wholly with God. Not one of them ventures to stir. Many words are spoken during this state in the praise of God, but the faculties have no orderly form. The intellect counts for nothing here. The soul would like to shout praises aloud, for it is in such a state that it cannot contain itself, a state of delectable disquiet. Already the flowers are opening. See, they are beginning to send out their fragrance. The prayer just described is the third degree of prayer, or the watering of the garden by irrigation, which St. Teresa clearly distinguishes in the book of her life from the prayer of quiet as the water of grace flows more abundantly and the virtues are stronger. We find, though, that St. Teresa has changed her opinion in the relation to Father Alvarez and in the interior castle. She writes in the relation, This prayer is called a sleep of the faculties. The faculties of the soul, will, memory, and intellect, are not so completely absorbed or suspended that it can be called a rapture. Though not complete union, the soul is often aware that the will alone is in union. Contrary to what she stated in the book of her life, she now attaches this prayer of inebriation to the simple prayer of quiet, because the faculties or powers, although inebriated with grace, are not united to God. The sensible effects are more intense, and the efficacy of grace greater than in the prayer of quiet. But the mode of God's action is the same. The will alone is truly captivated. St. Teresa observes in the interior castle that her explanation differs from what she said elsewhere. In this state, the faculties are not, I think, in union, but they become absorbed and amazed as they consider what is happening to them. It may be that in writing of these interior things, I am contradicting what I have said elsewhere. This is not surprising, for almost 15 years have passed since then, and perhaps the Lord has now given me a clearer realization of these matters than I had at first. Such is the prayer of quiet that sweetly holds captive the will, a little spark of true love for the Lord, which he begins to enkindle in the soul, a pledge that he is already choosing it for great things if it will prepare itself to receive them. Contemplative dryness or prayer of faith. The name suggests a prayer apparently quite different from the prayer of quiet, yet it is the name applicable to the first forms of contemplation described by St. John of the Cross in the ascent of Mount Carmel and in the dark night of the soul. There is a description in almost the same terms as those used by St. Teresa of the signs indicating that a soul should pass from discursive meditation to a state of contemplation. These psychological signs are well known. For St. John of the Cross, contemplation is a loving knowledge. It consisted essentially in 
receding light from the sun that is God, constantly warming souls with its love. This divine light normally produces the effect of darkness in powers not adapted to receive it. Dark night is characteristic of contemplation. It is experienced in powerlessness, in aridity, in the distaste of the faculties, unable to engage in operations which they previously found contentment and profit in. There is a certain peace, however, in this desolation. The soul enjoys being alone, in quiet and repose, without any activity of the powers, fixed in a loving knowledge, so subtle and delicate that the soul has no awareness of it, missing keenly sensible satisfactions of which it is now deprived. The first forms of contemplation are marked by dryness, powerlessness, and desolation. A little later, the soul is then like one to whom water has been brought, says the saint. Then it drinks peacefully without labor, no longer forced to draw water through meditation, so that as soon as the soul comes before God, it makes an act of knowledge, confused, loving, passive, and tranquil. It drinks of wisdom and love and delight. Farther on, the saint describes a state in which the soul remains, as it were, in a great forgetfulness. The cause of this forgetfulness is the purity and simplicity of this knowledge, which simplifies, purifies, and cleanses it from all its apprehension and leaves it in a state of forgetfulness and without consciousness of time. This prayer seems to be, seems to the soul extremely brief. The soul has been tied in pure intelligence, which belongs not to time. However they may differ, these first degrees of contemplative prayer show us an authentically supernatural action of God, exercised over the powers of the soul, a delightful flood of love, or of light springs from a deep source and flows into the will or the intellect or sometimes both. The faculties drink from the springs of living water, yet God doesn't give himself in immediate contact with the soul directly. There may be an inebriation of the faculties to the point of mystical sleep, but not complete union. St. Teresa would say, the faculties relive this living water only intermittently. Contemplation is imperfect. These first beginnings of supernatural prayer are truly a preparation for the prayer of perfect contemplation. Do they not sustain the faculties, make them more pliable, spiritualize them, purify them? This initial contemplation is aiming towards and is the pledge of union. What God has begun, he will bring to completion if the soul is faithful. When the soul has emerged from the beginner state but has not yet arrived at perfect union, these first forms of supernatural prayer, quietude, and contemplative dryness will be its habitual climate. This will be the base from which God will elevate it higher and to which it will promptly return. For until the state of union is reached, these seizures of the soul can be but transient. Amen.